Hey everyone, I'm Chris Lesniak. And I'm Rob Beyer, and this is the Debate Math Podcast. Well, the school year is fully in swing for many and just starting for others. We wanted to take a break from our usual format for a special back to school episode. Here at the Debate Math Podcast, we highly value discourse in math. On the podcast, we want to elevate the voices of teachers and students in our episodes, and we also want that for classrooms. We want to encourage student discourse in math class. So for this special episode, we asked a handful of educators for their quick advice on how to get students talking in math class. We did a handful of five-minute interviews with several educators. Please enjoy. Oh, and stay tuned to the end of the episode to hear about the online group where you can continue this conversation. First up, we have former television news reporter turned Staten Island's PS54 2023 Teacher of the Year, who loves politics and racquetball, Marcia Marbury Kilpatrick. Hi, Marcia. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, well, welcome to the podcast. Uh, can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Sure. Um, well, I work for the New York City Department of Education, and I'm at PS54, the Charles W. Lang School on Staten Island, and I'm currently a fifth grade math teacher. Awesome. Well, welcome. Now, the question of this episode, what is your best advice to get students talking in math class? Well, my best advice is first to find out what students are interested in. I feel that once you know what their interests are, then that pretty much piques their interest to be able to share out, to give their opinions about what they think um, of whatever topics that you are talking about. So definitely finding out what students are interested in, because once you do a deep dive on that, um, they are always willing to, you know, to share what they think about them. I'm I'm curious. Uh, can you share as a story of like when did that actually happen? Something you uh, really connected with a student, maybe one who was reluctant to talk. Well, there is a little girl in my class I could remember. Um, she actually is pretty quiet, and um, and she wears a job. And so when we were doing our unit on measurement, and I began to talk about you know, the types of like being able to do conversions in the U.S. customary system. And I began to talk about, okay, if you wanted to make a job uh, and you needed a certain amount of fabric, you know, what would you have to do or how much would you need? And so because of the fact that I put you know, that I begin to address something that I know is very near and dear to her. She wanted to be able to find out more because now that encouraged her to possibly go and do it herself versus just buying the, um, buying the, uh, the hijab off the rack. So what, what are like a strategy or two strategies that uh, teachers at the start of school year, how could they, you know, find interests and uh, what's like a way that you really like to get uh, kids engaged? Well, one of the first things that I do is when I first start the school year is that I actually give students um, a questionnaire, a blank questionnaire, it's a sheet in which they can ask me a question and then I in turn can reply to it and then ask them a question. That at least breaks the ice with us being able to get to know one another. And then aside from us getting able to get to know one another, it gives me an idea of what are types of questions that are rather about their interests that I want to include in my math discussions. And so just to really begin to get their, you know, get their wheels turning about, okay, what they're thinking about, how they feel, so forth and so on. But first things first, you know, I try to make sure that I have some idea about who they are. And I do, I have to admit, I do do a little reading uh, with the um, the profiles that I receive from their former teachers, you know, to get an idea of the type of student that I'm dealing with. And then I also do my research, right? Because there are some things like TikTok, that's like a newer thing. And I'm, I'm not as interested in it as they are, but I definitely make sure 
that I find out, okay, what's the gist of it? What's popular? So that when I go to talk with them about it, I'm knowledgeable. And one, I could even have them to share out more and teach me a few things or two, because they always like to teach you as well, right? So that's pretty much what I do. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that, Marcia. And if listeners wanted to talk with you more, where could they find you? Well, they could find me at um, at Miss Resource um, on Twitter. It's M S and then R E S O U R C E. Or they could also find me on LinkedIn at Marcia Marbury Kilpatrick. Awesome. Thank you. Next up, we have a teacher who has published twice already in the NCTM journal, a bride to be and a hardcore Swifty, Rachel Wimkin. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Glad to have you here. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Yeah, so I am with Hamilton County ESC and the Southwest region of uh, Ohio. So I'm kind of in the Cincinnati area and I work as a math consultant slash coach. Awesome. Well, glad to have you here. And the question we're asking on this episode is what is your best advice to get students talking in math class? So my best advice, I kind of have a couple things, mainly just because they go together. You can't really have one without the other. And to start, it's about giving students rich tasks that typically have more than one answer. Uh, so we're not looking for just one correct thing. It's got multiple solutions or we can do multiple representations. Um, you're very infamous, which one doesn't belong and getting students to justify why each one doesn't belong. Um, it kind of brings in that controversy piece, which is discussed a lot on this podcast. Um, and so when you're giving something that's controversial, students have different opinions and ideas and they don't always feel like they're wrong. So it kind of helps them with that, that confidence piece a little bit. Um, in addition, I also really like some small groups when they're working on things. Typically sizes two, three, four, three is kind of my favorite, like a sweet spot. Um, just so that you don't have one student who's dominating that conversation, or you have that one student who's being really passive and can sit there and say nothing and let the group do the whole work for them. So having that smaller group size gives more students an opportunity to talk and to share their ideas and feel comfortable doing that. So along those lines as well, having seats that are in groups instead of rows, because when we're in rows, that's really hard to have those conversations, to turn, to talk, different things like that. Um, so when you have them in that group setting, it can also give you desk space if you're trying to use manipulatives, tools, different things like that. You're facing one another, so that conversation is going to flow a lot easier, more naturally. Um, or you could have your groups up at whiteboards around your classroom. So think of your building thinking classrooms. Uh, you can have students spread out and you get them out of their seat for once in the day and they can be focused on the task that you've given them at hand. So those in sum and short are a couple of my favorite go-to things to get my students talking in the classroom. Excellent. Thank you. So a lot, a lot of group work and some controversial prompts to get them going. I'm curious when you talk about like the group desk arrangement, is it kind of like, like all facing in, like kind of in a circle or do you have like two on one side or what, what is your ideal three person setup? <laughs> Usually I'll have um, two desks facing each other and then one. So kind of like in a, not a triangle, but like two face each other and then one backs it um, at the end. Um, that way everybody's, it's as much of a circle as you can get it. Um, different desks, I don't know, every school has different types of desks. So that's gonna vary depending on what you have or like if you have a table, you know, maybe two and one or, you know, two and two, if you have four or something like that. But ideally to get as much of a circle so everybody can kind of see each other and feel involved in the task at hand. Okay. And then one last question, since you talk about group work, 
Do you have any uh, like routines or norms or activities, something that really help kids get into the group work? I know some students, you know, think that they just want to work solo and get their work done or, or are nervous to be in groups or whatever. So do you have any favorite things to go to to get kids started on group work? Yeah. So sometimes when I give out a task, I like to ask some questions before it's just go and solve this one problem. So maybe it's removing the numbers and asking students, what are some questions? What are things, what's information do you want to know? And having them generate something like that, or it can be like a notice and wonder, um, a variety of things, but those are a couple of the ones that, that come to mind and, or also, you know, telling students that there's going to be something they need to share and we'll go group to group and have them share something. So then students are preparing something to share with the class instead of sitting there hoping all the other groups are going to come up with something and they don't have to do anything. Um, but again, I like to kind of preface the task with preliminary discussion questions to kind of get them invested and interested in what we're doing. So maybe we're talking about football then what, what, maybe some people are not familiar with that. So what do you wanna know? And if I ask you um, like which team is better, what kind of information do you need to know? If people are talking about rushing and passing yards, do you know what that means? So it introduces an opportunity for vocabulary as well. Um, so those are a couple of things I like to do with my groups. That's great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And if listeners want to learn more or talk with you more, where could they find you? So I'm on Twitter at Miss Wimken, um, and my last name is W-I-E-M-K-E-N. Um, and you could also email me at rachel.wimken at hcese.org. I'm happy to follow up with anybody else that's a part of, that has more questions about what we've talked about today. Um, in addition, I'm a part of the Ohio Council of Teachers for Mathematics, so you can find me and a great group of people there. We'd be very happy to have some more people join our community um, as well. So. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And our next guest is a mathematician who is devoted to transforming how math is taught. He's also the creator of Prime Klein, one of my favorite games, founder of Math for Love, author of the new book, Pattern Breaker, and I just found out an ultimate Frisbee uh, player. It's Dan oh. Finkel. Hi, Dan. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? So I am based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, beautiful right now. Uh, I am the founder of Math for Love, and that is what is always taking my energy. But that means I'm doing different projects. So always working on new games and projects. We just launched Roly Poly, which is a game for four-year-olds and up, which is like a physical action-based game. We're going to be having some addition flashcards coming out in the fall, um, working on updates of our summer curriculum and just whatever other projects we can think of. Um, me and my wife primarily kind of just spinning out new ideas and new stuff. So, oh, yeah. I love it. I mean, I'm a big fan of Prime Climb. So, yes, we love it here. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, and now the question of the episode. What is your best advice to get students talking in math class? So, so many things I think come down to what does the teacher actually value? And I think that it's very easy to say you value students talking, but I think you really need to look at how your behavior supports it or doesn't support it. Because one thing I've noticed about students talking is that if the teacher does anything that communicates that their talk is not valuable, the students will clam up very quickly. So, so you want to be giving them reasons to talk. That is soliciting, actually giving them what feels like an actual motivation, not just you talk, but, oh, here's this thing that socially we need to talk about right now. Maybe it's something controversial. Maybe it's something that they just have some kind of an opinion about that it feels like there's just as a need for them to talk. So as much as you can create that need, that's good. You want to lower the barrier to talking. Um, and often, I actually found that doing games, I will sometimes play little openers that just involve a student saying their own name to their neighbor. Like something very simple, but just 
breaking the seal on talking and getting them saying something once uh, makes it easier the next time. Uh, and just so you, so you lower that barrier in whatever way you can. And then finally, once they do talk, you make sure that it is a rewarding experience. And there's no sense of, oh, you didn't say the right thing. Oh, that's not a smart enough question. Like it always has to feel like, oh, that was, you took a risk talking and it was totally worth it. And I think the more you can do those three things, create a need to talk, lower the barrier and make it a rewarding experience, the more kids will naturally start to talk. I'm curious, can you give us any examples about like the rewarding experience? And I'm also thinking about the beginning, you're talking about like the teachers, like moves and body language and what messages they send. Like, how do we send those positive messages that like, I want your voice and I, and I value you when you do talk and what, what thoughts do you have around that? Yeah. Well, let me give a really concrete example, which I've grown to love as uh, one routine, which does a lot of this very nicely, which is called counter examples. And the way it works is the teacher says something that is a conjecture, an educated guess based on a pattern. And I'll often do these at like what I think of as a kindergarten level, like, oh, I've noticed that cats have four legs and dogs have four legs, at least the ones I've seen and, and goats have four legs and pigs have four legs. I think that all animals have four legs. That feels true to me. Now, as soon as you say that, there's something in kids that's just like, I know that's not true. You know what I mean? They know it. And, and kindergartners will just, you know, raise their hand and immediately want to tell you why that's not true. Um, but maybe you lower the barrier. You say, you know, now maybe you think that's not true. Maybe you can show me the error of my ways. Chat with a friend and, you know, chat with a neighbor and see if you can come up with an example that'll show me the error of my ways. That's lowering the barrier to talking. Now they have kind of can rehearse what they want to say. It's very easy to get started. And then someone tells you, oh, what about a duck? And you're like, right, I forgot about ducks. Ducks are animals, but they only have two legs. So what I should have said is all animals either have two legs or four legs. Now that I know is true. And then, you know, you continue playing and they can continue giving you more counter examples. But in one sort of one routine, what that does is it creates a need. Everybody has something to say that's very easy to begin talking about. They, it gives them a little place to rehearse that's safe because they can talk with a neighbor first. And then you can accept what they tell you because they're almost guaranteed to give you an example that is actually an example that helps. And even if they tell you an example that's not right, you can still accept the suggestion even while you discuss like, oh, that would be a counterexample for another conjecture, but this one, but, but that's why I like to start with ones that are very, very accessible. Later on, that routine can get into some pretty high level math ideas. Um, but just the, the willingness, there's one other thing it does too, which is it shows that it's acceptable to put forward wrong ideas in discussion to the class and that the class is a place to throw ideas forward, even if they're not fully baked and not perfect yet, and that the class itself will refine that. And that's part of our work together. So demonstrating that as the teacher is also a really lovely thing to, to do. So then the students later can feel like, oh, I noticed a pattern. I wonder if it's true, but I don't feel like oh, it's definitely true. Um, so I love that as a routine. And uh, yeah, and yeah. that's one that I would highly recommend it almost any grade, I think. I love all of those. It sounds like you're really lowering the bar and making it really safe for students to enter. I'm just curious, do you have some pushback from like the shyest students out there? Is, is there still some? And do you have any strategies for that? Or, or do they just jump on it? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely, you know, there's always this question of like, is there an especially shy student, someone who like doesn't even want to talk to their neighbor? You know, how do you create that safety? And sometimes you really need to like, be noticing when that happens. If the barrier is really low, like if everyone, if you if you have a prompt that people want to respond to and they can immediately think of something to say and they can say it to their neighbor, right away, you're having a situation that is going to ensure talking happens for like 95 to 99% of the students. If you have that one especially shy student, you can kind of identify who that is and then they can become that person who you're like, okay, now how do I help this person? Can I have a one-on-one -on -one with them some other time? Can I, can I really give them whatever it is they need? Um, but, but it's, it is surprising if you can provide those three things. Um, people do start talking and it does, you know, the emotional safety, the need to talk, 
um, yeah, it it works for almost everybody. And and then you can focus where you need to. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Dan, for your advice. Yeah. If listeners want to learn more from you, where can they find you or where can they talk to you? Yeah. So I'm at mathforlove.com is my website. And we've got a ton of stuff there. And then I'm um, I'm on Twitter at at math for love, M A T H F O R L O V E, and basically at every other social media at math for love also. But um, and uh, and you can email me at dan at math for love dot com or info at math for love dot com or anything at math for love dot com will get to me one way or the other. So yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much for being here, Dan. My pleasure. Next up, we have a math teacher with a PhD in comparative literature, an activist, writer, Buddhist, and gardener. And a fellow teacher mentioned with me in the book, Motivated. Elizabeth Statmore. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Rob. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Great. Uh, can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Yes. So I'm a math teacher and writer in San Francisco. I teach at Lowell High School. I've been there for about 10 years, almost 10 years. And uh, I'm Let's see. Uh, I'm also our WASC coordinator, our accreditation coordinator this year. So really looking forward to um, using what I know about getting people talking to get our community engaged in that in that six year self study. Well, that's wonderful. And so now to the question of this episode, uh, what is your best advice to get students talking in math class here to start the year? So my best advice is make it urgent. Um, one of the things that I like to do, uh, especially at the beginning of class, when there's sort of, you know, various administrative nonsense that you have to do, I will pose a question to the whole class. And so it'll be like, what's the def, what is a triangle? Or what is a circle? And I pause for a beat and just let it sink in and let everybody panic. And then I say, talk to your table mates for 15 seconds, go. And 15 seconds is actually something everybody now uh, knows me for because I've made that the key. Now, you don't actually, you, you can be watching your watch and uh, go for 30 seconds, but telling students that they only have 15 seconds to get going is a great way to force everybody to use what they know. It's like, okay, well, got to lean in, say something. And what I want to do is get the whole room talking. Um, I don't actually care what the answer is. I don't actually care in that moment whether who knows and who doesn't. I want everybody leaning in and talking. So 15 seconds is a great way to make it urgent and set people into a panic about rather than worrying about whether they know everybody or they look weird or whatever, or are they wearing a mask? Um, like, oh my God, we only have 15 seconds to get this done. So when I'm done, so when, when I've determined that 15 seconds or my expanded 15 seconds is done, I ring my Tibetan singing bowl to gather everybody's attention and then I only take table group. I only call on table groups. So nobody's worried at that point um, about whether or not they know the right answer, who's going to get the most attention, because really all I want is a table group answer. And that's usually a pretty new thing to kids, too. The idea that um, the first kid with their hand in the air isn't going to be, you know, to receive all praise and glory. Um, and I don't usually say whether I think the answer is right or wrong. I usually repeat it and look around and get everybody buzzing. And then I'll call on another table and another table. And then that gives me an opening to dive into the instructions for whatever activity we're going to do next. If we're going to do a rich problem or if we're going to investigate or take some notes or whatever. But by that point, everybody is primed because the first time is always the, the hardest and the most painful in any transitional period. So getting kids to lean in and say, I have no idea. Do you have any idea? Um, just getting them all buzzing gets them relaxed and laughing and communicating. And then I can use other structures like talking points or debates later um, because I've already got everybody primed. 
So for me, the key is make it urgent, get everybody primed to start talking. So I was wondering, you know, as I'm hearing you talk and I hear, you know, trying to get students talking with some type of a question, how do you determine like what question to ask? Um, I mean, you said something about like a circle or a triangle. Um, is it related to like the topic of the day? Is it something that you just kind of do to get them talking to get them used to it? How do you determine that, especially at the beginning of the year? So I usually use it as a way to activate prior knowledge um, to get them buzzing, because the other thing that starts happening is the uh, the eavesdropping between and among tables. And I want that to happen. People will hear stuff that they know. And the point of activating prior knowledge is to get kids to remember what they know. Really, retrieval is the first step, especially in the early days of a new school year. So um, I will often ask about something really basic, really elementary, really subtle, or something that I know they've they've done that's connected to what we're about to look at. Um, I teach geometry, so I love to get kids buzzing about definitions because the idea of a definition in geometry and in mathematics, definitions are bedrock. That's what we can rely on. So um, I like to get them thinking about what do I know about it? What is a triangle? Well, I know it has like three sides. I know it has, gosh, I don't know. Does it include the center? Does it not include the center? What is a circle? Um, it's a round shape. And just, you know, getting them to, I really, all you're trying to do is get them to dig in and retrieve, eavesdrop on other tables, um, nod heads and forget that they're in math class. And I just, I'm curious how often you do this, like 15 seconds, is that several times within a class or once a class or once a week? It's usually one of the first things that I will do uh, to start a class. I have my administrative kind of routines. I have um, we have a 26 acre campus. So getting everybody from one corner to my classroom at the far corner, the opposite corner is not always um, possible. So the instructions are projected. There's music, lively music to start. Um, it, they give kids an, in, you know, instructions about what to do, take the handout, you know, talk to your table mates, see if you can make a list, what, you know, whatever those instructions are. So it's really and when all of that ends, that's also when I'm taking attendance and doing all of my, you know, announcements or any administrative nonsense that I have to do. Um, it's kind of the first class thing that I often do. I probably do it. I probably do it four or five times a week. Um, and it, it's just, a, it's also a way that I use to activate the prior knowledge that they need for the essential question of the day, which I always make a big deal of because that's a huge part of my practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, for jo uh, joining us, Elizabeth. Um, and if our listeners want to learn more, where can they find you? So uh, I am on Twitter and Mastodon and Blue Sky as Cheese Monkey SF. Um, and my blog is, uh, I have a teaching blog, Teach and Math uh, blog, and I blog there at cheesemonkeysf.blogspot.com. It's an old blog. Still running. Wonderful. Thank you. And next, we will hear from a former high school teacher author of Building Powerful Numeracy, among other books, a fellow podcaster with the Math is Figure Outable podcast, uh, who was also a pro basketball player in Switzerland. We'll have to hear more about that. <laughs> it's Pam Harris. Hi, Pam. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, glad to have you here. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm in Austin, Texas. My current role is CEO and founder of the Math is Figure Outable movement. Um, we've got lots of online workshops. We have the podcast. Um, my mission is to revolutionize the way we teach math. Love it. All right. And with that in mind, the question of the episode, what is your best advice to get students talking in math class? 
Yeah. So if I could just uh, ask, could, could everybody consider that what you do, what you kind of know, what you own is more than what you can say clearly. Like it's hard to put words sometimes. Like we own it, we've got it, but putting words to it is difficult. And we can put words to a lot more things than if I ask you to, to put it down. You've written a book, you know, putting it down that like it's it's a it's a big deal to put your what you know, what you own to put in words and then to be able to represent that thinking. If you can uh, buy that, then I would ask you to consider that that's also why we want to get kids talking as they're learning, because ask them a good question and get them thinking, but then pull out those words. So they're doing something, they've got some relationships happening, help pull out that thinking, because as they verbalize their thinking, they gain clarity about what they're thinking about. As they verbalize it and then hear someone else and restate and, and ask each other questions and then have to say it again, they gain clarity about what they actually were thinking about. They, they now know more than they did and it's more clear because they had to put words to it. Then I'm going to put a little bit in there where then the represent. So we know stuff, say stuff, and then represent it. I'm actually going to suggest that the teacher represent things first. So as the students are talking and I'm pulling out their reasoning, I'm going to represent what they're doing using a visual model. I'm going to try to put it up there because then it becomes discussable. Now we can point at their thinking. We can discuss their thinking in, in different ways because now it's there and we can have some, uh, but we have richer conversations around it. So my strongest suggestion for teachers, is give some, give kids things worth thinking about. It's not about mimicking algorithms. It's about really uh, reasoning. And as the reasoning, pull out that reasoning, pull out that thinking, help them put words to it. Then the teacher represent their thinking so that now we can continue the conversation, point at it, discuss it, and be able to have a richer conversation. Then give them something we're thinking about again, rinse and repeat. So we can really help get students thinking when they are talk thinking and talking when there's something we're thinking about, when we help pull out their words, when we help make it visible so that then we can point at it. I love this, like a three-step process. Do, do you have maybe just like one quick example just from a specific like lesson or unit in middle school, high school, or just like what's a good question you could ask to really get the them thinking in this abstract way? Sure. I'm going to do a younger example, even though I know you're, you're high school. Yeah, yeah. The younger but, is fine too. The example that's coming to mind is younger. Um, if I were to ask you something like 53 minus 10, you're like, well, that's not hard. That's 43. But then I'm going to draw 53 minus 10 and land on 43. And then I'm going to say, next question, 53 minus nine. And let kids think about it. Give them something to think about. And now kids might count backwards if they're if they're super young. Uh, kids might count back to 60. And What did I even say? 63? They might count back to 60. 53? They might count back to 50 and then keep going. But I really want to, uh, then I might say, did anybody use... 53 minus 10 to help them think about 53 minus nine. And when a kid says, well, yeah, like you subtracted too much. So I'm going to add, then I might go add. No, we're subtracting. Don't add. And they're like, wait. And then we get a conversation going where I'm like, are we adding? We're subtracting. And I want kids to, to come in, like pipe in their thinking as they do that. I'm going to say, where is, so we've got this jump of 10 on the board right now. I'm going to say, where is the jump of nine? Cause you told me to jump back 10 and then pop up one. But where's the jump of nine? Oh, it's the difference between them. And as soon as I draw that difference, now I'm not going to draw it instantly. I'm going to make them tell me. Somebody's like, it's right there. It's a shorter jump than 10. Then all of a sudden they're like, oh, that's why you added, even though you were subtracting. Okay. Hey, give us another one. And then I'm going to do something like 256 minus 200. Go ahead, Chris. 256 minus 200? 56. <laughs> so then what's 256 minus 99? Yep. So then I'm going to minus 200, wait, minus 99? Uh-huh. Uh, oh, gosh. Um, on the spot here. See, so now I'm, I should be drawing it. So 256 minus 100. 256 minus 100, you said was 156. Oh, yeah, minus 100. Okay. And then add one. Which is? 150. 157, yeah. Bam. There you go. See, that would have been so much better if we actually had the visual. Um, yep, if I yep. actually drawn it up here, that because yeah. you would have just you wouldn't have had to have held it in your working memory. You it would have just been up there. And y'all, that's one of my biggest um, pushbacks on people that say, no, 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 we just have to tell kids what to do if they don't have good working memory. And I say, no, I almost said a bad word. No, 
Because what, what we can do is just relieve that working memory by that represent. When I did that three-step process, give them something to think about, pull out their words, represent it. Now it's not only point outable, but it's referenceable. And so the, the, you didn't have to keep that 156 in your head, or whatever we were. I think it was 156. You see, I can't keep it either. I lost track already. <laughs> you could have just looked at the 156 and said, I know it's one more because we subtracted too much. So it's 157. And it, you wouldn't have had to keep that in your working memory. We can help kids think and reason like mathematicians in a lot of ways. But one, pulling out their thinking, having that good conversation so they clarify, and two, representing their thinking. And so you like to have the teacher doing the representing, at least in, the, in these discussion stages. Yeah, at least at first. Later, I'll then say to kids, hey, you know, you've seen me represent your thinking. When your brain did that, it looked like this. Mm -hmm. When your brain did that, you saw what it looked like. Hey, your brain's doing that again. Go ahead. You're like, what does it look like? And then I'll actually ask back that representation. So for example, if we've been doing constant rate of change in an algebra class and the kids are like yeah like it's always and i'm representing their like every time the time goes by we go up the same amount and up the same amount and i'm representing that at first later i'm going to say what would that line look like you know like, mm -hmm. have you seen your brain that i've represented seen your brain brain visible your turn but i'm going to do the modeling first and i think that's uh again it's not me it's not uh careful as soon as i said that i'm like people are going to hear Therefore, show kids. It's not me showing. It's me pulling out what they're actually doing, representing that, giving them a chance to see their own thinking. Often that way, they can find their own errors. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pam. That was great, great advice to get us going. Um, and if listeners want to find out more, where can they find out more about you? Absolutely. So I hang out on Twitter a lot at, at PW Harris. Uh, you can get me at Facebook at the Math is Figure Outable page. And also, we also have Math is Figure Outable teacher group. Uh, lots of good conversations happening there. Uh, Instagram, Pam Harris underscore math. Um, and definitely the website, mathisfigureoutable.com. Wonderful. Thank you. And finally, we have a math educator, co-author of the book's Intentional Talk in Mathematizing Children's Literature, and mother of drag, I mean teenagers, mother of teenagers, Dr. <laughs> Allison Hens. Hi, Allison. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hey, can you tell our listeners uh, where you are and what your current role is? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Hins. I live in the Pacific Northwest um, in the Seattle area. I'm an ass associate professor um, at University of Washington on the Bothell campus, and I study mathematics, teaching, and learning. I mostly work with pre-service teachers, but also get to learn alongside practicing teachers and families in informal settings and communities. Fantastic. And so the question of this episode uh, is, what is your best advice to get students talking in math class? Okay, I love this question. And you really got me thinking when you asked it. I think I would narrow on two things. Um, and one is give students something to talk about. And second is listen to them. So in order to get students talking, I would argue they need something good to talk about. And I notice your books in the background that think a lot about these ideas too. Um, so I just think about how to select and design tasks and questions that can guide that. Like, is the problem interesting and open enough to have many different strategies and solutions and possibly answers? Um, does the task allow reasoning and argumentation to emerge? Does it have broad access? So a wide range of voices and perspectives can be heard. And in learning about that and practicing this um, with other mathematicians, I've been inspired by the talk that can explode or, or erupt from tasks like how many and which one doesn't belong by Christopher Danielson. Um, I, there's also an article that really supports my thinking by Corey Drake and Julia Aguirre and Aaron Turner and team called Opening Curricular Spaces. And it helps us think about how to approach curriculum in ways that promote students talking and elicits and builds on the knowledge that they bring to our learning spaces. So the first thing I think about is give people something interesting to talk about. And then when we've given students something to talk about, I think it's really powerful for us as the adults in their lives to stop talking and to listen to them. And as we listen, we can ask open-ended questions to get ideas out. We can orient students to each other's thinking um, in the mathematics, and we can ask generative questions um, that promote collective sense-making. I have a really dear friend um, and colleague, Dr. Kirsty Tyson, and she says, students listen, 
the way they are heard. And so now that we have students talking, we want to think about how are we cultivating deeper listening in our learning spaces. And the reason this really matters um, is that we want to have broad participation where all students are positioned as sense makers who belong. And we have to think carefully about the tasks being meaningful and relevant to students' lives, whose stories are told and considered in our spaces, whose ideas are taken up and valued, who's positioned as a knowing contributor. And we make all these decisions as the educational leaders in learning spaces. And so I think if we want students to talk, we have to think about what are they talking about and are they being heard? Wonderful. I, I love that part about listening and really like kind of modeling it as a teacher, like we're, we're listening and if they, we want them to listen, that's great. I, I'm curious for teachers out there who are listening to, into this, uh, any advice about you have a student that's just so shy, so nervous to talk and you just, as teachers, we want everyone to participate and also feel comfortable and safe. So so how do you balance that or how do you encourage the, the shyer students? Yeah, I love that question. Um, that's me in a lot of learning spaces <laughs> and um, living inside that um, and, and doing a lot of interviews with students who are, who are particularly quiet in learning spaces. I've learned how active participation is as a quiet student. Um, I got to sit with many students whose form of participation is active but quiet and rewatch videos of them participating in classroom discussions and invite them to pause the video at any time and talk about what were you thinking when this discussion was happening. And so they would pause the discussion and say, here in this moment, um, Rob is telling us that he's thinking about this. And Chris is adding on that he's thinking about this. And I got to learn that quiet students are so actively participating and have really important ideas. And that part of our job is to um, help amplify their voice in ways that work for them and ways that position them as really important contributors doing important work in our community of sense makers. And one of the students that I learned with, um, I'll call her Nora, I, I knelt down next to her during a discussion and I said, I can see you doing that. I can see you where you're following along. Is there anything you wanna share? She didn't, but she said I could share her idea. And so then I said, okay, I want to add in something here. Nora's thinking about this. And so you you kind of like expand their voice and start bringing their voice in. So I think a keen eye of watching for active participation through listening, recognizing that listening is an active form of participation and extending people's voices for them to position them as someone who's bringing really important ideas to our community um, and start to help them see themselves and be seen by others as someone with really important ideas to be heard and start to build in space for their voice to be a part of our discussions. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I hear a lot of, you know, the listening and then trying to get everybody involved. And, and so I, I was wondering, you know, for the final question, um, if we have new teachers coming into you know the profession or teachers who have never really experienced how we can get students talking because we know it's like a, it turns into a culture right yeah like within the first days of school like what they you know we always say the first 10 days what are some yeah. things that they could do to try to help cultivate that culture of getting students to talk and the listening and like what are some some key tips there that that we could uh, you know share with them as they try yeah. to venture into this journey that's an awesome question because um, facilitating open discussion and lively discussion is really challenging work. And we know that the teacher's role is active, but we're, we're not controlling everything. Um, and so we have to have uh, embrace the messiness. Um, and I think using a really open-ended task that'll get people talking is a, is a quick success. Like with my pre-service teachers, when we go into classrooms and practice facilitating math talk with students as new teachers, an open-ended task that everyone will have an idea about is really helpful. So so toss up uh, which one doesn't belong and get people talking. 
Um, and then have a small list of questions that you can tweak and make your own that helps you think about what you might say in the moment. And even if it's something like, who wants to add on to Chris's idea? Who has something to say about this? Repeating, I hear you saying that you think this. Who wants to respond to that? You can have some really like um, open-ended, broad questions that you can use in almost any situation that gets people talking and gets you putting it back to them to get their ideas out. Um, and you don't have to know the perfect thing to say. You can even just say, what else? Or who wants to add on? And just keep people talking. Um, and you can keep repeating their ideas and keep getting it out. And then the, the students start to take it and own it. And you can listen more deeply and follow up. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much, Allison. So glad to have you here. Uh, if our listeners want to reach out to you or learn more about you, where can they find you? Oh my gosh, I would love that. So um, I can share my Twitter handle. I could share my email. Are those two go, things? Yeah, go for it. I'll, okay. I'll do. okay. So um, on Twitter, I'm at Allison Hints 124 And my email is a Hints, which is H-I-N-T-Z, at uw.edu. And I would love to hear from people in, in any way, because I'm learning these things too. And I want to learn from what you're trying and really awesome things that your students are doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Be sure to go to our Twitter at Debate Math Pod to share your thoughts on this episode. Which ideas stuck out to you? And huge thanks to all of our guests who let them uh, let us interview them during their summer vacation here. They shared such great advice. And I'm excited to share, I have started a Facebook group for Debate Math. So if you want to follow up with this or other conversations or Debate Math activities, just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Debate Math. Debate Math is one word. Thanks to those of you who are listening. We hope you enjoyed and learned from this episode, and hopefully you can get students talking here to start the year. Have a great school year. Mm -hmm.